are for Skeptech at uh, Dragon Con 2015. Woo! Woo! We're going we're gonna to try something a little different and talk about skepticism and technology. We talk a lot about uh, alternative medicine and science and uh, those types of things. Um, let's talk about technology and how skepticism relates to that. But let's first introduce who's on the panel here. Uh, I'm Tim Farley. Uh, you may know me from a website called whatsaharm.net. Um, and I blog at skeptools.com and I've been doing skeptic stuff for a while. But I'm also in, the, um, in my day job, I'm a, in the technology industry. So I kind of know sort of how these things work from the side of the people who create the technology and how the information gets out there and, and uh, how wrong things might be said about products and stuff like that. Uh, so that's where I'm coming from. And we also have Tom. Uh, by the way, I'm a big fan of What's the Harm. Oh, thank it's you. A, it's a fantastic site. Uh, my name's Tom Merritt. I'm the host of Daily Tech News Show at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, I've been a tech journalist for more than 10 years. I've worked at Tech TV, CNET, Twit. And uh, one of the things that I try very hard to do in my show is deliver people a critical reading of the tech news. So there's so many rumor blogs out there, so many blogs that don't necessarily lie, but they like to fudge things for a good headline or clickbait, uh, and other blogs that aren't trying to do any of those things, but just don't give a complete picture of technology. So from the other side, uh, from what you're doing, I'm trying to read the tea leaves and pull out what people can trust uh, based on kind of triangulating readings and my own experience. Yeah, ditto what Tom said. Um, my name is Veronica Belmont and I got my uh, start in the tech industry as a uh, producer and editor for CNET Networks. Um, then I hosted a show called Techzilla, which was a tech help and product review show for revision3.com, which later moved to Discovery Digital. Um, I'm also a contributor on Daily Tech News Show and I'm also a startup advisor and board member in San Francisco. Great. Um, one of the things that may not be obvious to folks who consume technology press or whatever is the effect of PR. I know Tom mentioned to me uh, talking about PR. And uh, because there's money involved in products that they're trying to sell, you get public relations people involved and people sending out press releases about their products to try to get them written about in the press. Can you talk a little bit about how I assume you get inundated with press releases all the time? Yeah, uh, and I pretty much delete 99% of <laughs> yeah, them. Yeah, it's true. Uh, and I, I do that, I mean, partly I do it because a lot of them you're just like, that, this isn't even appropriate. Your horror film opening in LA next weekend doesn't belong on my tech show. <laughs> uh, so it's surprising how many PR companies just feel like, ah, blast it everywhere. Uh, but even the ones that are topic appropriate, I, I don't want to look at. I don't want to uh, be in any way not swayed, but I just don't want that information in my head. So I take the approach of looking at either primary sources, uh, so a website from the company that shows you know, their actual list of specs, uh, or uh, cultivate what I consider to be reliable news sources that I can sort of read two or three and triangulate them. I, I try to stay far away from PR. Even then, Press releases tend to generate stories in those sources mm -hmm. that I am looking at. Yeah. So you have to, one, sometimes you'll notice like same story, same story, same story. And so I have to get a little skeptical like, okay, these guys are just rewriting the press release. Right, right. Yeah, that's a really good indicator. When you're receiving a press release and then you see all the tech blogs starting to have carbon copy blog right. posts, you're like, well, okay, well now I know that you guys are yeah. really just regurgitating the thing that just hit my inbox too. Right. You're not adding any critical thinking to the information, you're just spinning out the email once again right. yeah I get I get tons of emails like that and if there's any indication that I'm just part of a form letter it immediately goes in the spam but I especially to delete the ones that say dear Veronica which I get we get <laughs> <laughs> I get dear Tom more times than I can even count because we do another podcast together as well and uh, that's for sci-fi fantasy and so we get a lot of that as well that people uh, we're very easy to confuse obviously um, yeah. but Same it's, yeah. but the the problem is though that sometimes there are valuable emails and and I, I I do look for them so if I get the sense that someone's writing me a pitch email but they're contextualizing it for my content they understand who I am what I'm doing what my audience is then I'm usually going to at the very least notice it and read it um, but you can tell pretty quickly when they're like 
we want to, you know, we'd love to write a guest post on your blog for veronicabelmont.com. And I'm like, there's no blog on that site. <laughs> if you had taken like two minutes to even look at that, like I would feel like you were actually engaging with me and, and the content that I'm looking to make. Right. So it, it takes a little added effort, but I think if you're in the tech world or in the tech journalism world or reviewing or an influencer or whatever it is, you, it, the PR, PR needs to make that next step to try to you know, capture our attention or else we're just gonna be like, yeah, no, no, garbage, spam, immediately. Yeah, there's a good um, plug here. It's not really tech-oriented, but it's skeptic-oriented. Uh, a guy by the name of Michael Marshall in the UK who's with the Merseyside Skeptics and the Good Thinking Society does a blog, I think it's on Tumblr, called Bad PR. <laughs> and they have a particularly large problem in the UK with the tabloid press just taking P press releases and regurgitating them into news stories. And the press has gotten really good at kind of pitching um, things that seem like they're not a product uh, placement, but they really are. And then they'll just do like a cheesy survey or whatever. And he picks them out. And he's gotten where it's like literally it's always, the company name is always mentioned in the third paragraph mm. of the Daily Mail article. Oh. And mm. uh, and he's gotten it down where he can recognize exactly which PR company. So I, I recommend you check that out because it's educational in terms of being able to recognize when a news story has been cribbed from a press release mm -hmm. and really doesn't have a lot of reporting in it. Um, the other thing I've noticed is that when I read my, I have a folder in my feed reader, in my Feedly, that does a lot of the tech sites, and you'll see the exact same news story about the exact same product pop up on The Verge and in Gadget and Gizmodo yeah. at the same minute. Yep, like that's when the NDA or the embargo The embargo tell, ends totally at 9 a.m. Yeah. and boom, that piece of news comes out. Well, that's, yeah, that's, in, so disclosure, I have a show on Engadget and my husband used to be the editor there. So I, I understand the process of like being first to press, right. so when you get an embargo on a major news story, and you know it's going to go live at 9 a.m. Pacific time, they're all like, depending on how long they've been sitting on the content, if they have the time to go through and and do more critical thinking and actually write opinion pieces on the post and do some advanced other other reporting on the topic and kind of you know build a real story there, um, that's great. But sometimes they don't have that luxury, yeah. so it's just you know they are all competing for the same eyeballs, and so there's this just rush to, to get the post up as quickly as possible. And sometimes that does hurt the quality of the post, absolutely, and you just see kind of carbon copy blog posts happen right. at the same time. When I see that avalanche happen in Feedly, uh, I will make sure that I read two or three, maybe more, different posts and look for the one writer that was able to contextualize it somehow and say, yeah. the one thing I noticed when I was using this product or, or what's interesting is this compared to another product that mm -hmm. I know, okay, that did not come out of the press release and that helps me decide whether this is actually worth putting in my show because everybody's reporting it and it's really exciting or whether it's just, you know, it's gonna float away. But the other thing that you can look at is Google News with its algorithm and tech meme, which is more of a human intervention. A lot of times you'll see things like hit because of the press release and they never show up on Google News or tech meme, uh -huh. which is because nobody's really interested in them. They're not getting mm -hmm. any traffic. Right. It's, it's just that everybody felt they had to report on it. Yeah, there used to be, I was looking up tools that I could recommend for folks, and there used to be a really cool search engine called Journalism, but unfortunately the nonprofit apparently that runs it uh, either the interest died out on it or, or whatever. But what it was was they would basically troll the websites where these press releases get promoted, like PR Web and there's a couple of others, mm -hmm. um, and put them into an index. And then they would index the news stories and they would literally highlight the parts that were cut and pasted out of the press places. release. <laughs> yeah, so you could look at a news story and go to journalism and say, oh look, like 80% of this news story has been cut and pasted out of another thing. That's so good. And then they did it for Wikipedia too, so you could see which Wikipedia article the, the journalist was cribbing from. But mm. unfortunately, uh, they've stopped supporting that, so. Well, and that's one thing that I've tried to do is cultivate a list of sites that I can tell don't do that very right. often. And I, I can't say any of them never do it, but uh, if I, there are plenty of blogs out there that you can look at and you know, you know what, I'm just not gonna believe anything from that blog anymore. And that's, that's something that I hope people get better at, which is choosing the sources they decide to use and pay attention yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What, um, how, other than uh, you know noticing the differences in the 
in the different stories and finding the one that contextualizes it. What are some other things you could recommend for um, sort of red flags or green flags, I should say, in a story that says, hey, this, this seems to indicate that this person went beyond the press release and actually, for instance, actually tried the product out? Yeah, I mean, if you really want to tell, uh, generally a decent source will also link to the press release itself. Mm, mm -hmm. uh, oh, there you and go. so if yeah. they don't, that's suspicious. Uh, right. Uh, but if they do, go look at that and say, okay, that's that's the source material. That's the specs. You know, those are the those are the things that the company is saying. And then you go back and read the other story, and the things will pop out. But mostly, I look for the author taking ownership of what they're saying, and not just reporting like it has this in it, but but observational things uh, about using it, uh, comparisons to other products that show they actually have had experience with this type of product before, and especially any negative evaluation. Like yeah, this is a small amount of RAM. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Any skepticism usually means that they're actually thinking about what it is that they're looking right. at and reading in a press release and being like, well, you know, they say this, but back in December when they had their press conference, they said this was going to be happening. And, yeah. and then you get the sense that they're not only just reading it, they're following the story and, and staying on top of it and, and aware of all the new news as it's happening. And any superlative positive words, actually, superlative negative words are, aren't any better but any superlative words in reporting are always suspicious like amazing this amazing new. beautiful new phone <laughs> amazing this new. revolutionary <laughs> new device with its chamfered edge yeah the game that, changing the thing that always became a pet peeve for me was when they would say something was the first product of its kind hmm. and inevitably i would know of an earlier product it's like probably had. not <laughs> probably not that's that's definitely something to, to keep in mind and and looking at multiple sources, I mean, Hacker News, uh, if you're following tech news, is a great place to look because it's developers and hackers submitting things they think are interesting. Now, sometimes those are going to be total hype train items because everybody gets excited about it, but the comments on the posts are, are full of critical thinkers who will poke holes in things, and you can find holes poked in articles that you would not have noticed because somebody just has a particular area of knowledge. Uh, and you also won't see things that aren't very interesting or don't have a lot of substance uh, posted up there as often. Right. Uh, any other good sites that you can recommend for to do good reviews or or do a good job of being skeptical about product? I, mean, I, I could read through my feed leaks. Yeah, Tom, for me, Tom is like my go-to source at this point. Um, but I think Ars Technica is probably still one of the yeah. best, most legit, like, does their homework, does not really let their opinion be skewed, like, really just follows through with everything. And, and for, I mean, even I've even heard stories that it's hard for them to do a podcast or be on other podcasts because... They don't like to have conjecture about stuff. They yeah. like to they oh, like right. to absolutely know. So if they don't absolutely know what is going on about a topic, they're like, I don't really want to touch that because I don't want to say something that's incorrect. Yeah. Until I've studied it, like figured it out, and really gotten to know the subject. That, so they're they're serious about it. That's I'll bullshit about anything. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. But, well, but you're just, you're about about right. it. to show how serious they are. Just recently in July, they did the million dollar challenge at the at the amazing meeting, and and this year. They did a technological challenge. It had to do with cables. And if you know, there's a lot of baloney about uh, about monster cables and these other cable brands that mm -hmm. claim that their cables are better than, than the other guy's cables. And there was one particularly ridiculous claim that claimed the music playing over a particular Ethernet cable. Oh, if you yeah. know anything about how digital what? music works on <laughs> a network. How, that's not how it works. That the music would sound better over this Ethernet cable. Oh, so Jesus. so Ars Technica <laughs> wanted to test it and they they said, Well, we, we'd like to do a, a challenge on this, but you know, the the James Randi Foundation is the one that knows how to do these challenges. So yeah. they, they partnered and uh, did a test. And it wasn't perfect, it wasn't the, the you know, the definitive test, but it was an interesting test to see it put, put to the test right there on the stage. Well, Wirecutter, I think, is also a really good source for product reviews um, because they they go to the... They use the stuff. They use the stuff they don't just for bring it months in for a week. and months yeah. and months, sometimes longer, and they just they dig down into the product so much, and 
the the experts that they have on the site just really really know their stuff you know from audio to to video to gaming to everything i mean they've they've basically gotten experts from from every major site to to come work for them and and do the reviews and and it's it's i don't even think twice now i just if i have to look for a product review i go to wire cutter as my first stop to be fair on the ars technica uh, study of the wires though they did find uh, that those higher level wires did carry a lot more money away from your wallet <laughs> <laughs> They're good at that. That's oh, right. Tom. Uh, but yeah, source source wise, <laughs> uh, Ars Technica is at the top of my list for sure. I mean, I don't know. It would be kind of boring for me to just read through this entire thing. Um, but uh, Feedly does a cool thing now where you can share your lists with other people, and I've done that. So if you use Feedly, you can you can look for Tom Merritt uh, oh, and find the list. That. But oh, uh, nice. TechCrunch is up there. I, TechCrunch used to be off my list. I would not pay any attention to them in the mid-2000s uh, because I felt like they were just always chasing clickbait. And at some point, I started seeing more and more things linked to them that were well thought out, well researched. The staff is excellent there. So if you're still somebody who thinks of TechCrunch as like, oh, don't they just do buzzy headlines? So they've, they've definitely turned it around. The Verge is great. Recode uh, has some really good particular experts. Uh, so for things like uh, cord cutting, for instance, or Internet of Things, uh, I go there. Fortune hired a bunch of the good people from GigaOM when it went under. Oh, yeah. And so Stacey Higginbotham is over there. Barbara Darrow's over there. Uh, so they have, it's kind of a mixed bag with Fortune. You, you get some business reporters who obviously don't follow tech as closely doing okay articles, which is why they didn't used to be on my list. But then you get these GigaOM reporters that are just yeah. knocking it out of the park. That's a, that's a good tip, too, there, is to know a little bit about the person who's writing the mm -hmm. article mm -hmm. and whether or not they have a tech background because a lot of times you'll see a business person reporting on a company issuing a press release and they won't understand that the technical claims being made in the press release might be a little bit ridiculous. Yeah, just and, and not out of even incompetence, just out right. of a lack of experience. Yeah, there was an incident, um, and, and I'll show my age here because it was over 20 years ago, but it was a company right here in Atlanta that claimed they had this revolutionary compression algorithm and they claimed that they could reduce... Oh my God, was it Pied Piper? Huh? <laughs> no, it was a company, a company called uh, Web Technologies in Smyrna in 1992. And they claimed they could take any file that was over 64K long and reduce it by 1 16th. Or reduce it to 1 16th its size. And then the thing that really showed them up that they were kind of selling some crap is that they said you could take the file that was already compressed and run it through again. And it would compress again. And there were business reporters just reporting the press release from this company and saying, hey, this amazing technology invented right here in Georgia. And all the technology reporters are like, um, no, that's not mathematically possible. So there were a lot of folks from Byte magazine and the other technology press who pushed back on it. And lo and behold, when they asked to do a demo, they could do a demo of the product, but when asked to provide the software, suddenly nothing worked. Yeah. And that happens across beats, even within tech publications. Like if, if there's somebody like Stephen Shankland at CNET uh, has covered open source for years, if someone else at CNET covers an open source story, they're going to miss things. Yeah. You know, and, and, and sometimes get some things wrong. Uh, right. So you, you really knowing the author really helps uh, to understand just, just how trustworthy, how much depth of knowledge you might be getting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another story like that that was uh, really interesting, and it, it, it came home to me because I do, in my day job, sometimes I do reverse engineering where we actually take software apart for security stuff. And there was a product back in the Windows 95 days that claimed it would double your RAM. And um, I can do that yeah. myself by buying <laughs> by, by more, adding RAM. more RAM. By more RAM. <laughs> this is, you know, it's funny to think about these products like the the disk doublers and whatnot because back then disks and RAM was actually a lot more expensive comparatively than it is today. Um, so people really wanted this stuff, and uh, so they sold apparently 600,000 copies of this piece of software that claimed to double your RAM. And somebody in Germany actually took it and took it apart and literally was able to prove that not only did it not double your RAM, it didn't do anything. 
Oh. It was literally a null di device driver that basically like a placebo sat there effect. Yeah. yeah, they had That's literally awful. taken the demo device. Here's how you build a device driver from Microsoft and changed the names in it, recompiled it, and and loaded it in there, and, it, and then they just changed a few settings. Um, and so the FTC ended up going after that company and fining them Good. a bunch of money. I've I've seen less egregious examples of that where someone will take a software setting or something that you can easily do on your own. You just yeah. go to Lifehacker and, and, and read right. the three steps and they'll create a script that mm. does that and then charge you $30. Like, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll increase your, your storage space and all it does is create a RAM disk, uh, you know, on your right. desktop or something. Right. Um, yeah, that's something, you know, actually that that's worth mentioning is that if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah. And so it's, it's worth you know, spending that five minutes on Google to see if there is an easier solution or a freer solution or something you can do yourself to, to get the same results without shelling out money. That's yeah. a, 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 an advantage that we have now that I don't think we take advantage of enough mm -hmm. is the ability to check a claim. Uh, and if something like a piece of software or a piece of technology says it will have an effect, go, sometimes I do this, look up on uh, your favorite search engine how to do that thing, and you'll find out whether it's nobody can do it or whether there's a lot of cheaper ways to do it or if there's a way for you to do it yourself that's super easy. Yeah, one of my favorite websites is alternative2.net, and so if you find like a great solution, an expensive piece of software, and you're like, this seems like a lot of money to be paying for this thing that I need. You just plug in what the name of the software is, what platform you're looking for, and it finds you all the you know freeware or open source versions of, of things that do that. So you can oh. Yeah, what? sorry. The, wor the worst are the ones who take like Firefox and sell it. Yeah, I know. Oh, yeah. you know, and and they follow they follow the letter of the license, and they're right. going to do that, and they just try to take advantage of people who don't know of anything. Yeah, yeah, I had some experience at work with some scammers that were actually successfully scamming people out of fifty bucks a pop for upgrades to their Adobe Reader, oh. which is free. I mean, if it actually made the upgrade secure, <laughs> I, I might pay for it. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, another good site to, uh, to recommend, or at least I find is good for questions like that, is the Stack Exchange mm -hmm. series of sites. Mm -hmm. They started out as programmer questions and answers, but there's actually one that's oriented towards skeptics, but there's ones for all sorts of topic areas. So there's photography ones, and they get these deep, deep technical questions, but the site is oriented so that the really good answers to things automatically percolate up to the top. Uh, so that you don't have to read a 52-page long forum thread to find the good answer down at the bottom. It'll, it'll automatically be pulled right up to the top. That's a, that's a good one. Uh, stay away, on the other F side, stay away from Yahoo Answers for anything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> unless you really... Uh, I see you've discovered you want this the funnies, mostly on your own. Yeah. Because the, it's very entertaining. It's very yeah. it's entertaining. good for comedy, yes. yeah. yeah. But Cora... How is Babby formed? The site Cora has, it has mixed... Uh, a mixed success for me, but sometimes you'll get an industry expert who really thoroughly answers a question mm -hmm. really well. So you kind of just have yeah. to pay attention to who's answering, but Cora can be good. That seems too. to be the, the value of Cora is that, you know, the people, the person involved will come yeah, on. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah, you, I cannot believe some of the people who answer Cora questions. Right. Like Mark Zuckerberg is answering this question about Facebook. Right. You're like, what? Yeah, and you'll see a question of, you know, how did this product get the, get a venture capitalist interested in it, and, and the CEO of the company will come on there and right. answer Or the questions. venture capitalist will show right. up and explain well, why they did. Well, this is why I spent the money, yeah. It's right. Q-U-O-R-A, if anybody's not familiar. Yeah, uh, and it right. works very similar to the Stack Exchange sites, mm -hmm. the question and answer sort of stuff. Um, are there any um, sort of other uh, red flags in terms of buzzwords or uh, words that you look for that kind of uh, flag something as maybe a ridiculous claim or? Uh, yeah, when they flew me to, uh, or we, you know, uh, when when <laughs> company X yeah. brought me in, uh, it it doesn't always invalidate it, but it definitely is a red flag for me to know right. like okay they were even the best journalist will be in a bubble when they are brought into something, and that doesn't mean they shouldn't go look right. right. If they have enough critical faculties, they sh still should be able to pull out some information. But the hoverboard uh, 
articles, for instance, and I'm not even talking about the Lexus one, I'm talking about the Hendo uh, the, in Silicon Valley. Great people, I've emailed with them, they have a real product, uh, but the enthusiasm of the journalist reporting on it because they were there and got to write it was out of proportion with the, what the product is from what I could yeah. tell. And again, it's t totally natural because they got to stand on a hoverboard and float around in, in a little room. Right, right, exactly. You get to be the first. Um, and that's hard though because you want to be there and you want to get the access. Exactly. And if you don't, sometimes, I mean, the only way you can really get around that is, you know, you don't accept any of the, you, your company pays for everything, yeah. you know, it's, you can't really make it a junket, it has to be separate somehow, yeah. but you go, you accept the invitation, but yeah, you're still there, you're still part of the enthusiasm, you're still in the moment. And but. it's, again, it's, it's a red flag for you to be critical, not to throw it out. It's really easy to find the things that you're like, this is unbelievable, this is just a rewrite of a press release. Those are much easier to mm -hmm. spot. Finding the more subtle influences on otherwise honest people trying to do a good job is where it gets tricky, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is some of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, and I can tell you a few things that I've experienced personally. Um, there are these groups um, that do, if you work in the industry, uh, that kind of do uh, white papers and things uh, for folks to uh, learn about the product landscape and who the, who the players are and where things are going. Uh, people like Gartner and Forrester and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they, they, it's huge amounts of money. Literally, you have to spend thousands of dollars a year and they send you these big notebooks where they've done all this research. And I actually had an experience to meet one of these analysts who worked on the product category that I was personally building at the time, a long time ago, and I won't mention which analyst it was or what the product category was, but we knew that it was really hard to test our product because you had to simulate real hmm. world traffic on a computer network in order to do that. So we happened to be out to dinner and this, this person was there and I was very curious about, well, how do you test these products, right? Because you write these white papers about our product and all the competitors. And I was shocked to discover that not only did this guy not have the greatest test lab that I'd ever heard of, he didn't have a test lab at all oh, and had never actually touched any of the products that he wrote these giant white papers that he charged thousands of dollars wow. for. And he was basically just, he would go around and talk to people in the industry and, and, and get their marketing materials and stuff like that and analyze what people were saying about what their products did. And I'm sure he was able to cut through some of the fluff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there's only so much you can do until you actually try the product out and actually test it. I was, it was so disappointing to me to learn that that was being done that way. That kind of reminds me of the just the, the tech journalism echo chamber, yeah. Um, because that that kind of reminds me in a way because, you know, someone will review something, another person will review something. They start posting their reviews, talking about it. Then other journalists read those. They start kind of adding their their yep. input, and then suddenly all the opinions start to kind of feel the same, yep. because. I feel like the more reviews get written about something, the more reviews are being read, and so they're subconsciously taking mm -hmm. bits and pieces of other people's opinions and integrating it into their own, right. until suddenly it feels very much like a like an amoeba of opinion that's kind of the same. Yeah, uh, that's another good red flag to keep an eye on, and most reputable blogs that you'll want to read uh, will link to another blog if they're saying, you know, we saw on TechCrunch, we saw on The Verge. Uh, drill down. When, when you see that, go find that source article. Find that that blog that said, we discovered X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. Because that's that's a whole lot more informational and valuable than a rewrite up from someone else. Yeah, one of the things that I always recommend people do as just a ordinary citizen is if you're active on social media and you see those link-throughs, Drill down, and if you're about to post on Twitter, hey, there's this really cool thing, drill down and find the original person and link to them. Mm. Don't link to the Verge story that just embedded the YouTube review. And, you know, link to the actual guy who made the video or the a woman who made the video and give them the credit for actually doing it instead of... Uh, you know, somebody who's just aggregating information that they found elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, if you want to give a hat tip and say, I saw on The Verge this, that's great. Sure. But link, yeah. I think you're right, link to the original. If you yeah. Can, if you yeah. can find it. 
What about surveys? Because uh, when you're talking about Gartner and Forrester, the one thing that I do find valuable for them is when they give market share estimates and trends oh, sure. that, are, are, that are actually going. And, I, and it's one of the things I fight with my audience sometimes about because they're like, well, it's a survey. They only, they only interviewed 2,000 people. How do they know? <laughs> and, and that is a tricky one for people to wrap their heads around because you know, anyone who has studied statistics knows there is a way to get within a reasonable margin of error uh, some accurate facts by only surveying a representative sample. And so you have to look at what their methodology is yeah. uh, and find out, okay, did, was it weighted? Was it balanced? What was their margin of error? Was it a phone survey? Did they select the sample? Look at those sorts of things to find out if, in fact, it's a real survey. If you see, like, we put a poll up on our site, those, those results may be uh, entertaining, but they're certainly not going to be valuable. Yeah, and that's a big part of the guy I mentioned earlier, the bad PR blog. A lot of those things end up being surveys that were done by a PR company. You know, something related, if they're trying to promote a dating site, then they'll do a survey on people's dating habits, or what do you like in a man, or what do you like in a woman, and then they'll pitch that as a story, and then mention the dating site that caters to whatever that thing is that there is. But when you drill down, you find out that they surveyed 50 people or you know 27 people or something like that. And that's you know it's hard to imagine that it would be meaningful with a, such a tiny sample. Right. But not all surveys are bad just because they didn't survey every single person on Earth. <laughs> like you, you can still get valuable yeah, information. Yeah, you know what you're doing. But you have to make sure that the person conducting the survey is A, independent, not the site that has an mm -hmm, axe right. to grind, and B, that they actually did the statistical work right. Yeah. Um, Derek mentioned right before we came out something that we should probably cover a little bit because it's technology related and it's right in the skeptic wheelhouse is the whole thing that's coming up again. I've seen a couple articles recently of people afraid that Wi-Fi is going to make them sick. Yeah, I, I've, I've been real sick at this con. Yeah. <laughs> We're all dead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this, this comes up every so often, you know, Wi-Fi gets installed in somebody's school and their kid gets the sniffles and then they are convinced because they Googled it and Dr. Google told them that Wi-Fi is bad. Uh, and they try to convince the school to take the Wi-Fi out of the school. And I think there was a successful case in France of somebody who actually got some government benefits or something claiming that... <laughs> yeah, made, you know, claim they had uh, had gotten sick. Um, any advice on trying to convince people that their Wi-Fi hotspot is not going to make them sick? Yeah, that's, you convince crazy. Well, that's, <laughs> that's that's always the problem, right? Is uh, what when you're dealing with something that is so unproven, it's hard to convince someone that they're wrong if they just want to believe it, right. right? We all know that. But it's very similar to the cell phone radiation yeah. uh, controversies, which none of us really do this all that often anymore. We've got headphones and headsets and stuff. So it's kind of started to go away. But there was actually legitimate concern about cell phone radiation, not because of radiation, but because of heat. And they're like, well, you're heating up your brain. They're, we may be seeing indications of effect. We need to do better study. So we tried in the Buzz Out Loud days very early on to give people the tools they needed to understand that issue and say, here are the studies that say there might be an effect. And here's why that doesn't mean there is an effect. And here's why more study may prove that there isn't any effect at all. So when you see one study finding an effect, uh, don't immediately assume that that is the definitive study. You have to have multiple studies. And we talked right. about samples. And yeah. we talked about, we tried to help people understand how to interpret scientific results. And that, that goes into a lot of panels that we have here about how to interpret science. And the Wi-Fi one, to me, is almost harder because you have no studies to point to uh, that say anything other than no effect. Uh, right. And so it, it's, it just becomes a he said, she said, because people are like, yeah, but obviously they haven't done enough studies because they haven't <laughs> found an effect. And you're like, and so what I end up resorting to is saying, look, this is light. This is this you know radio is 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 a, a wavelength of light and radiation comes from the sun and when you go out you're getting radiated so don't don't respond emotionally to these particular words because your uh, radiation and 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 radio waves aren't necessarily a bad thing we couldn't see without them 
Yeah, yeah. Be, be more concerned about leaving the house without SPF on. Yeah, right. You oh, know? yeah, Like, absolutely. I mean, there's there's so many other things out there. I, not to Ooh. negate their concerns. We should but. sell SPF for Wi-Fi. Yeah! <laughs> Millionaires! Oh, no. The evil side. <laughs> the evil but side it, of skepticism. Yeah, but I mean, it's true. I mean, they're, they're worried about this, of which has, like, no conclusive evidence whatsoever, only studies that say, no, don't worry about it. And yet they, they you know, you don't think about being in the sun and, and right. getting sunburned and, and the really obvious basic things that you should be concerned about. And they're just, right. it's the hype, it's the hype behind it that, that drives people yeah. crazy. And it's a really difficult one because you feel like I've got, I've got, you know, a lot of great evidence that shows there's nothing there. And, and worst of all, there's no reason to suspect there would be an issue with it, and and so it's it's really hard to argue with someone who's like, yeah, but I still think it. Like yeah. I don't know what else no. to do. Yeah. Sorry. The one the one interesting argument I've always thought was good with the cell phone thing, and I guess you could make this for for Wi-Fi is the cell phone claim was that it would cause brain cancer, and cell phone use has exploded so much over the last 25 years or so. Mm -hmm. I mean, it went from nobody had a cell phone to everyone has a cell phone we should have seen an explosion in brain cancer, right? Or at least the it beginnings should, of one, it right? It should be yeah. in, the, in the epidemiological data that there's way more brain cancer than there is today. Well, there's not. Yeah. Right? Well, so, and 11, 11 years ago when the story was first breaking, it was harder to make that argument, right. but it gets easier every year. Yeah. Right. Well, it should. Yeah. <laughs> at least so far. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I'm trying to think of what other topics we haven't gotten to. And we can also, I guess, open it up for questions. Yeah, to we can. Too. We can do that. Um, if people want to start lining up at the mic, up, oh, we've got some people right on. Right, nice we got shirt. takers. This is like good. It. And we will do some questions. I mean, there's got to be so much radiation on the Enterprise. I mean, right? Like, who's talking about that anyway? Whatever. <laughs> those, those warp That's fields. That's a great shirt. Sure. Very like dangerous. That nebula yeah. there. The yeah, shield. No, That's what they're for. Anyway, um, I've always, for I don't know, many years. Red and Gadget, and then The Verge for my pretty tech news. Um, but lately, let's say like the last two years, there's been a lot of flack on those. I mean, like articles that weren't, that wouldn't have been there before, like um, superhero movie reviews. Uh -huh. And um, even like, I couldn't believe when I saw it, dating advice. So I hosted an advice show on Engadget, so <laughs> I'll, I'll start are, with are that. You, are, you, are you the one? <laughs> so no, but um, yeah, so I'm not speaking for Engadget here, so let's just make that clear. But I think that a lot of, are you finished your question? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut well, you off. Well, yeah, I'm just saying it's, it's, hard, it's getting harder for me to cut through all the, 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 and get to the pure tech news, which is really what I want. I think there's still sites for that. I think sites like Engadget and Gizmodo in particular and a lot of the, the, the sites that used to focus very heavily on product reviews and, and things like that are becoming more lifestyle sites. And I think that's reflective of the changing atmosphere that we live in now in which, you know, a lot of people enjoy technology and it's not as hardcore as it used to be. And so as that audience change and becomes a little more mainstream, I think the sites are also becoming a little more mainstream in terms of their scope. And also we're just getting into, there's a lot of interesting tech and things like film and video and, and we're moving into, you know, the Netflix Hulu era of, of media content where that's, you know, that's pretty tech heavy and interesting from that perspective. So they're, they're evolving to try to match their audiences, but there are still some sites like Ars Technica are more, you know, like a little more hardcore. Tom's hardware. Yes, yeah. they, those sites mm. still exist. You just have to have to look for them. But Engadget and Gizmodo, they still cover tech, but they're they're spreading out a little bit more. Yeah, it's it's a it's a normal evolution of any media sphere. The same way I was talking about how TechCrunch got better, you're going to see other sites changing over time, and we're all familiar with uh, you know, the learning channel being anything but the learning <laughs> channel. Uh, actually renamed it. And yeah, it's now just TLC. And it, yeah, and <laughs> exactly, just, and just renaming yeah. it. So you're going to see the same thing happen with websites. The beauty of the web, though, is while it's really hard to replace a channel on cable television, which is why the learning channel becomes TLC, starts showing reality programming, and we're just left with, ah, oh, I've missed that channel. There'll always be other websites coming in to fill that niche because there's going to be people like you who want that information. So I would keep an eye on things like techmeme.com, 
uh, for interesting new uh, new blogs that pop up and are co covering the type of topics that you like. Right, and a lot of people don't even go to just one site anymore. I mean, I feel like the era of you being like a fan of Engadget or a fan of Gizmodo isn't really the same because we're getting so much information disseminated to us via social media that it kind of more depends on who you follow and like depending on where the stories come right. from. So if I'm following a very like hardware geeky audience on 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 Twitter, then those stories are going to bubble up for me. But if I follow a ton of different types of people from all different industries, I'm getting a much wider reaching range of of, of topics that I'm reading about. So you can also curate that yourself, you know, based on on what you do on social media or, or subscribing to something like Feedly or another RSS reader, um, where you can really kind of fine tune the 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 information, the data that you're you're pulling in. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to ask one more thing. Like, when I'm buying a, a new piece of tech and I want to read all the reviews I possibly can, of course I go to Verge and, and Gadget and Ars Technica if they've done it and you know everything. But I also read comments from con people who have bought it, consumers like mm -hmm. BestBuy.com and Amazon. Now I know that there there are tips and tricks to kind of discerning consumer reviews like the ones that are obviously fake and have been paid for right like the product was great excellent fantastic mm -hmm. dot 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 no details you know do you guys and, and i think there was a list written like if they use these words if they you know then it's fake then it's real do you guys have any um hints or tips or tricks to to try to help a, a, a person decide whether review is fake or real Sure. Yeah. Uh, when I when I read reviews like that or on Yelp for a restaurant mm -hmm. or anything, Yelp. Uh, mm -hmm. I throw out the bottom results because that's somebody who was just angry, uh, you know, and probably was not going to like that restaurant. And I throw out the top results because those are likely to be people who were either way too friendly with the staff, you know, maybe their friend runs the restaurant or their sock puppets. Uh, so you look in those middle ranges and look for people who, again, are not using a lot of superlatives because it can be just as bad for someone to have an axe to grind and be angry as it is to have someone being paid to write something good. So if you if it looks like it's a balanced approach, if the story makes sense, like, oh, yeah, I've had a similar experience. Uh, it, to me, it's it's a little more, it's less of a list of things than it is kind of looking at whether it feels like a real person's voice wrote it. and. And that's something you can tell, like, does this sound like a commercial? Does it sound like PR? Does it, does it sound like something that was written by somebody? Or does it sound like conversation? Uh, that's one of the first things I look for. But yeah, superlatives, you know, uh, any, mm -hmm. any kind of puffery language uh, or, or anything that goes way too long is another thing. Yeah, we used to, um, my husband used to write a site called Gadget that was like uh, tech product reviews, essentially. And what was really great about it was that you could see what your friends had reviewed things. And for me, it's, it's much more valuable to see the opinions of people who that I value like over just randos like for a restaurant for example like mm -hmm. you go to yeah. some restaurant it has really great reviews you get there like oh this is not what I was expecting at all but if you're on Foursquare Swarm and you see that your friends like the people you hang out with and and like have similar appeal uh, similar tastes similar tastes yeah you can be like oh Joe liked that place okay yeah that, he seems to really like it I'll, I, we, we have similar tastes I'll check that out so it, it's harder to find like social graph product reviews these days but I I tend to find sites that I kind of align with in a way, and maybe I'm not exposed to a lot of different kinds of things, but at least I know that our tastes are on a similar level and I'll probably like it for the same reasons that they liked something. That's why I go to Wirecutter, just because I you know, typically my views align with theirs in terms of the products they like and don't like. So that's that's kind of how I navigate that that area. And the sock puppets are gonna have much many fewer personal reasons or experiences in their reviews. Look for the people who said, I bought it because I needed to extend my Wi-Fi to another part of the house, and when I put it in, it helped me this much, but here were some problems, here are the things I liked about it. Like, it, that, that's harder yeah. to fake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can tell whether or not it bears on what you want to do with that right. product, right? right? Your needs. Yeah. I, I had a, a, there used to be a, a, a neat little thing called every block that would find content that related to your neighborhood. And I would get this email from my neighborhood and it would show me Yelp reviews, new Yelp reviews of all the businesses in my neighborhood. And there was a new coffee shop 
And it's like, oh, this is great. There's not a coffee shop in our neighborhood. So we went to it, and it was absolutely terrible. We, we, we finally decided it must have been a front for a drug operation. <laughs> because it was it, like a Mr. Coffee machine? Yeah, it was yeah. literally. It was like a Mr. Coffee machine, and they had bought bagels at the local supermarket, and, and they were oh. still in the bag. And so we never went back, but I would get the every block email, and you'd literally see like bad review, bad review, bad review, and then you'd see this burst of five star reviews. I don't know what all these other reviews are about. This coffee shop is terrific. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the fact that I'm I know the owner. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, was, or am the owner. Yeah. Or am the owner. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Watch dear Veronica on Engadget. Product reviews and dating advice. <laughs> Hey guys, um, I think Gawker is known for having some somewhat questionable reporting <laughs> practices, and a lot of people, myself included, tend to view Gizmodo as guilt by association mm -hmm. and kind of put a lot of skepticism against their reviews just because we don't like what Gawker is saying and some of the stuff that they've done. What's your opinion on a kind of a bias like that? I used to have that same bias about TechCrunch, uh, not because they were owned by Gawker, but because uh, I just felt like that's all I saw from there. And it took me a while to get over it. But what I would say is you still need to evaluate every article independently and the different authors independently. And one of the best things that I think Gizmodo may have done is bring Annalee Newitz over from io9, which is also a Gawker property, but just fantastic about science fiction and fantasy, and put her in charge of Gizmodo. And maybe that will help them uh, improve some of their coverage. But Gizmodo still has great articles. Mm -hmm. I get you. They're not in my Feedly list, though, because I, it's a little too much of a, of a low percentage of good articles to bad articles still. Yeah. Yeah, my, my kind of pinnacle of that was during the TV Be Gone phase at CES, like, what was it, 2010 or something, when uh, one of their editors was going around and turning off all the display TVs for the presentations. And that rubbed a lot of reporters the wrong way because hey, those are people too. You know, yeah, they work for big companies, but CES is the biggest thing we do all year and, and their whole like careers and lives are tied up into these presentations going well. And one reporter kind of screwed that up for a lot of people. But yeah. Um, and plus, I was, you know, my husband was, was, was with Engadget at the time, <laughs> so that was also, you know, a little bit of, of thing there. But yeah, Annalie is amazing, and I really, you know, you can, you have to take everything with a grain of salt, like Tom was saying, and, and go article by article, but I, 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 I do feel better about their vision and, like, where they're going for. For Gizmodo, I can't speak to Gawker at all. Like, I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole, well, but, and, yeah. Uh, Lifehacker's part of And Lifehacker's right? amazing, so, I mean, yeah. It, it just, it, it should, you're, you're, I'm right there with you as far as being skeptical about what mm -hmm. I'm going to get from that source, but you have to go writer by writer and know the companies are made of people. One thing to keep an eye on is, do they keep reporters? Do they stay? Uh, that was one of the things that started to happen with TechCrunch is they got rid of some people, some really good people stayed, and I started to realize, okay, maybe I can give them some more of my attention. So I would keep an eye on that. And that's exactly too. what happened to Gawker recently, too. I'm sure you're all aware of all the drama they had over essentially outing a private figure um, for uh, marital indiscretions. And it was a huge story, and like three of their top editors just left. Yeah. And so now they've got some new reporters. And then when I see the new reporters, I'm like, oh, were they just hired on because they're going to toe the party line right. and, and not like yeah. fight, a, fight against what they believe is wrong or right? And so, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a day by day thing over there for sure. It's, for me, it's my candy reading. I don't take too much stock into any of it. You know, it's, it's like tabloid yeah. reading. It, it's the thing for me, Gizmodo particularly, that if it shows up on Tech Meme and I read the article and it seems solid, fine, but it's not somewhere I, I go to regularly. Right. One of the things you can do, and I do this a lot with, uh, it, you know, it goes to who the journalist is and what's, what their history is, is on most of these sites, there's usually a link by the journalist's name, other stuff written by this person. See what else they've written on mm -hmm. that site. Do they always write about the same sorts of topics or are they all over the place? Or are they always, uh, and another a red flag maybe sometimes can be, are they writing like a long series of articles on the same company or the same things? Now that might be that they cover that beat, it might be their beat but it yeah. might also mean they have an ax to grind. 
and they hate that company or something like that. And if they, you don't find any articles on that site, go to their social media feed and see what they're talking about. Um, is this something that they cover all the time and they're talking to other people in the industry or is this just something they parachuted in and wrote an article off the top of their head on some topic that they've never written about before and maybe they haven't thought about it as deeply as, as another person has. So mm -hmm. those are good tools you can yeah. use. Companies are made of people. Man. Yeah. People yeah. are different. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Next up. Two tall people in a row. We're good. <laughs> Um, Hi. Do you guys have any uh, humorous stories where they've you've seen reviews that are one direction that's like basically 180? You know, I can think of maybe like uh, uh, the, um, what's the the scooter, the segue, segue where people <laughs> predicted, you know, well, if we just change every sidewalk in every city, yeah. everywhere. We just rebuild all perfect, the cities. Right? Yeah, this yeah. is yeah. the perfect product. Can you think of any ones where you, you got some press release and then what you finally found was just so humorously different that... Are there anything like that? Or? That's a good question. Um, I feel like, yes, they're definitely... It's not really examples. a review, but I, I can tell you a story about... Uh, there's a tech, some tech incubators here in town over at Georgia Tech and stuff, and they'll do these meetings, they'll do bar camps and things, and they'll have people talk about technologies. And do you remember Google Waze? Or not Google Waze, Google Wave. Wave, Wave. Wave. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right? Google Wave came down and it was this thing where it was sort of like Google Docs with a chat thing and it was just this weird thing Nobody that didn't, knows. It didn't map onto anything. And I went to a presentation over there at Georgia Tech and they had two folks who had gone to Google and had gotten the presentation from Google and they were telling everyone in the room, literally, if you do not revamp your company and get onto this Google Wave thing in the next year, you are doomed. And I was sitting in the back of the room scratching my head going, what are these guys smoking? And sure enough, like a year and a half later, Wave was gone, mm -hmm. right? It, it had disappeared and they shut it down. And I, I still don't exactly understand how people get so excited about somebody else's product that they were, these were not Google employees. These were just independent, or I assume independent, technical mm -hmm. people who had gone and seen a presentation at, at Google and thought Wave was the way of the future. And you, boy, if you had taken their advice that day, you would have spent a lot of money building something that would have disappeared. You know, it's hard though because I think as, as journalists when, and uh, like when you are at events like CES or big trade show, you're so eager to see something different. You're so eager to be wowed by something for once that like when something does come along with a little bit different, you're like, oh, maybe this could actually be cool or this could be a game changer. And sometimes that excitement is reflected yeah. in, in the post, but it's not, not always that case. Uh, yeah. The Palm uh, Web OS. Is oh one. yeah! Uh, so you're saying talking about CES made me think of that. It, it was <laughs> dark, you know. Oh, it has cards. It's like gonna save Palm. It's gonna drive out iOS. Uh, were a lot of the things people were saying, and it, and here's the thing: Wave was interesting. It was, right? yeah, it could well, do it was some really interesting. cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But nobody, people were like, we don't know what it's good for, but I'm sure we'll figure it out. Right. right? right. With WebOS, it was like, wow, this is a really good operating system, and nobody bought it. Like, right. It just wasn't good enough, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Right. We got yeah. one guy. Did you say you bought it? Yeah. Okay. Just replaced it the beginning of May. Nice. I'd forgotten about that because I used to be a Palm before I got Palm on the smartphones. I or you know these phones. I got. I was a Palm user for years. I had several of the trios, and yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I was excited that oh, oh maybe Palm's great. gonna pull out of the dive yeah. and not not to hit the mountainside. But it was not to be. Hi. Hi. Uh, what do you guys What do you guys think about clickbait? Since you guys did talk about it a little bit, and talk about what? Clickbait. clickbait. Oh, clickbait. Um, I don't know if you saw, but about two weeks ago, I think uh, Cracked had a YouTube video explaining humorously, but the necessity for clickbait, and it's also how not it, it's not in the writer's control always, but at the same time, also they need to eat, so you need to attract the clicks, unfortunately. You won't believe what happens next. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> Let me tell you five things you won't believe about clickbait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, click, click, yes. The answers may shock you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Number four amazed me. 
Uh, just uh, go to this URL and you'll get an answer. <laughs> well, there's like, there's like proven formulas that work, and I'm sure they probably touched on that in the article. Um, and what has happened is now every single article sounds is written yeah. in the same way with the, with the titles, and, and it's, it's very visually exhausting. And yet I still find it working, even on me. Like yeah. I see something and I'm like, what does happen next? Here, here's the, <laughs> I, uh, full disclosure, used to be the headline writer for CNET. Uh, and so, you know, my job was to get people to click on a headline and go to the story. As the headline writer, that's, that's your job. And that's, that's been the job for the people who wrote the covers of magazines, headlines, newspaper headlines, get people to read the article. What you always hope to do in that situation is get people to click through to an article that they will then be satisfied. And I think what has happened with clickbait is you're getting people to click through to an article that has no substance. Right. So to me, it's fine for Ars Technica or Scientific American or somebody like that who has a substantive article to use the kind of words that will capture your attention as long as they're not lies and as long as that article on the other end is substantive enough. And that was what we tried to do at CNET was come up with captivating titles that will grab your attention, make you want to read, but didn't make you feel disappointed at the other end. Because mm -hmm. at least with CNET, we weren't worried about just driving page views, we wanted repeat page views. We wanted people to keep coming back and think of us as right. a place that was valuable and that they would want to turn to anyway. Uh, so to me, clickbait isn't doing its job right if it takes you to a place and you're like, oh, this is a piece of crap, why did I click on this? Like That gives you a bad association with that outlet and they're just, they're just playing the numbers game. They're just trying to grab as right. many people as possible. When it's good, it says, you know, five hot Asian phones, and then you click through. I didn't think you were going to say that. Uh, <laughs> that was a real headline that we used at CNET, and it was great because then we'd have CNET Japan's, like, five new phones, you know, with really good reviews, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, it made you laugh because you're all like, whoa, what's up with that? And, and <laughs> that's fine as long as you deliver with an actual five phone reviews that are worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've become a learning machine in that case where I, I now look to see where the link is going to take me, especially if it's on like yeah, Facebook or something like that. If I see that little link back and it's like one of those garbage sites that takes you to like a 40 slide baloney piece of crap. Oh, I'm like, yeah. no, I'm not, I'm not playing that game again. No way, no, no how. And so you just move on to the next sensational headline. Yeah, one, one good tool there is uh, you guys all know about Web of Trust. Uh, mm -hmm. Web of Trust is a site, it was originally designed for spam and malware and, and you hate sites and things that, you know, no one should go here, right? And, and people, and it's crowdsourced, people would rate them and the sites mm -hmm. have ratings, uh, but they have a plug-in in your oh, browser and it will actually plug in and if you read, if for instance you use the web version of Twitter, it'll put in, uh, in Google and I think in Wikipedia and a lot of sites it knows how to do this, it'll put a little icon next to the link and even if it's a shortened link, it'll put a little green, uh, yellow, red icon. So if it's one of those terrible sites, yeah. you'll get a little red circle can next to it. Can you mark your the, own? Can you like... You can mark your own, but unfortunately your mark doesn't change the icon color. It just goes okay. into the pool, huh? Yeah, yeah. Your, okay. your vote just goes into the pool. It'd be pool. good if you could add your own to be like, fool me once. But, it, but if you, what, what it does do is if you mark your own and you accidentally, you do click the link, a pop-up will occur, will appear that says, you previously oh, rated okay. this site That's badly, good. and then you know to back right out. It's a good resource. Yeah. Not just the, well, the redirects, obviously, but also, but within, like, like uh, just as an example, BGR.com. Um, some of the writers I, I like, I like Zach Epstein, a couple mm. of the other guys, but their headlines are all just awful. Yeah. And I've, I've kind of just learned to filter it out. And like, right. Oh, they're talking about something else, but it's, And, you know, and hey, don't, great. never right. blame the writer of the article for the headline. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of times a headline will not even match the content of the article because, you know, as oh, Tom yeah. said, some guy somebody, like me was, yeah, yeah, I've some written articles before headline. or done videos and then the, the name, the, when it, it gets posted, I'm like, I did not say that. Whoa. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so it gets, yeah, it if comes you, from a directive. And if you pay really online. close attention, the same article will sometimes get pushed to you with several different headlines because they have these, what they call A-B testing yeah. tools. Right. And they will tweet it 14 times during the course of the day. I don't know if they go back and delete the old tweets. Or, no, or, no. But anyway, they'll so. try different headlines and they'll actually, uh, you know, measure which one got the biggest click-through rate and then they'll start pushing that one harder. Yeah. I know what you mean about BGR and sometimes I'm like, come on guys, you're, I'm not, 
like I'll find an article later that I didn't click because I, I had the same reaction you did, and then I'll be like, this is actually a decent article. Like, you, they're, that to me is not doing the job right. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? We got time for one quick one. If anybody's one got one. One quick one. All right. Well, let's go into Plugorama. Plug, right. plug some stuff. Oh, okay. What um, do you got? So yeah, I forgot to mention in the beginning, but I do host a show on Engadget called Dear Veronica. Um, we do tech, tech advice, um, social media etiquette, um, product reviews, all sorts of cool stuff. We actually just recently did a, a skeptic's guide to meditation. Nice. Um, on the episode uh, with uh, with the anchor from ABC, Dan Harris, who recently wrote a book on, on the subject. And uh, I also do Sword and Laser with Tom Merritt. It's a uh, weekly sci-fi fantasy podcast and uh, book club uh, over at swordandlaser.com. And I host a show called Vaginal Fantasy, uh, which is a, an erotic sci-fi fantasy uh, book club and video show with Felicia Day, Bonnie Burton, and Kyla Casby every month at vaginalfantasy.com. When, when do you sleep? I don't, <laughs> but it's fun. Uh, DailyTechNewsShow.com is most pertinent to, to this panel. Uh, if you're looking for a daily podcast that can kind of run down the headlines for you, like I'm doing all that hard work every day of sifting through that stuff and trying to find what I think is the most relevant for people to pay attention to and the pertinent facts out of that. And then we discuss them and we talk about our opinions about it. That's DailyTechNewsShow.com. Sword and Laser, obviously. I also do a weekly podcast called Cord Killers. Uh, if you're a cord cutter and you're looking for resources to you know, hardware, software, or just cool shows that are out there that you can watch on the internet, that's cordkillers.com. And a weekly wrap-up show called Current Geek, which is just about geeky news of the week. He sleeps even less than I do. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And I do uh, whatsaharm.net, and I blog at uh, skeptools.com. Uh, I'm on Skepticality with, uh, with Derek um, uh, most of the time. Most of the time, you... When I remember to get him a segment in time. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, when I don't have a wedding that I'm going to, um, or being in. And I do a weekly uh, uh, vodcast or uh, video, live video on Wednesday nights called uh, Virtual Skeptics at virtualskeptics.com. Kind of a little panel show, a little, a little more off the cup than skepticality. Um, and uh, so we'll see you there. Yeah.